Christian Chandler Neil O'Donnell. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Podig McLaughlin a, a minute of my time because I'm very good natured like that. Um, Tishak, to fault his free road, August Goromoy, get more dirt, Koglaki has a Vailin, August Kora Vailin, August Hun Eshak, La Kora Lahar, and St. Shannon and Shaw and you. Tishak, you can probably guess uh, what I'm going to say to you uh, on behalf of the Sinn Fein uh, party, but it's uh, a core uh, of core importance and I think uh, of core brilliance that this Shannon affords people like me uh, and my colleague Senator Marshall the opportunity to engage with you uh, and colleagues in this House. A core tenet of the Good Friday Agreement states that a person born in the North can identify and crucially be accepted as Irish, British or both, and therefore is afforded equal treatment with regard to their rights. After the Good Friday Agreement was signed, the Dublin government codified in its law recognition of the dual nature of citizenship for people born in the North, thus accepting both nationalities and their responsibilities under the GFA. The British government did not. For 20 years, they have dodged their responsibilities under the Good Friday Agreement, never codifying uh, in law the provisions for Irish citizens born in the North to be accepted as Irish, only that they could be identified as Irish. A subtle difference in words, but a vast difference in practice. Essentially, it means that under British law, Irish citizens born in the North are classified as British citizens by default and are treated under law as British. This is a flagrant violation of the Good Friday Agreement. But until now, until Brexit, it has gone uncorrected, again because Irish and British membership of the EU helped it stay camouflaged. Brexit has forced this issue into the open, perhaps not a bad thing in this one particular instance. It not only highlights the British disregard for the Good Friday Agreement, but also brings into sharp focus the unequal status of Irish citizens who are born in the North. It is hard to convey the shockwaves that rippled across Ireland on the morning after the EU referendum when the result was announced. We could scarcely comprehend the implications of a Leave vote for international relations in general, or for Ireland in particular. Not only as part of our island under British rule, and it would be forced out of the EU against our expressed democratic will, but the island of Britain uh, also forms a physical barrier between Ireland and the rest of the EU. And when challenged about the issue of consent, the British Supreme Court dismissed the democratic rights of people in the North and concluded that the North's membership of the EU was a matter for the UK alone. This writes large the obs obscenity and injustice of being ruled by a foreign parliament. In regards to the issue of rights, what will change after Brexit Day? Straight off the bat is the freedom of movement, one of the indefeasible freedoms of the EU. Currently, EU citizens have all the rights necessary to visit, live, work and study in other EU member states without being subject to immigration rules. Irish citizens born in the North will by extension hold EU citizenship, which means they will still have the freedom to move to the EU. However, Northerners with British passports won't have that level of freedom to travel to the EU, and non-Irish EU citizens travelling to the North from elsewhere uh, in the EU, from the South, for example, will be subject to tough immigration controls. And how will that movement be policed exactly? We're told there won't be a hard border in Ireland. Basically, there won't be physical barriers. But the stricter rules will have to be enforced somewhere. Will it be by the bus drivers taking people into the North? Will it be by the employers? Will we have a case of certain people being singled out and treated like second-class citizens? Then there is a democratic right to vote and stand candidates for EU elections. That right will be lost to all citizens in the North. And Tishag, as you know, you could have done something to help us in that regard, and you chose not to. We were left behind. On one hand, you want to give us the vote for President, the right position, a position we support. But on the other hand, we are being denied the right to democratic franchise and representation in the EU. So we are not full Irish citizens. We are not full EU citizens. We are also losing access to the Court of Justice uh, of the EU, the Court that administers justice in cases concerning EU law. The Court that has been a safety net for citizens who believe they did not get fair treatment in the, dom the domestic judicial system. Leave campaigners were clear that whatever else happened, the Court of Justice had to go because they wanted to end interference from outside powers in the governance of their country. God forbid they would have to suffer uh, ex external interference, and this from a nation that colonised half the world. The irony is lost on none of us here, Tishak. Post Brexit, a whole raft of rights will evaporate. There is no guarantee that the British government will secure these rights, and even if they do, a Tory government will light a bonfire underneath them. They have made a promise to that effect, and unlike most of their promises, they are apt to keep this one. We know this because they are fundamentally opposed to rights and equality, and have partnered up with those uh, denying rights and equality, denying progress to those of us in the six counties. 
Brexit negotiations reached a milestone in November with the publication of the withdrawal agreement, a legally binding agreement between Britain and the EU that sets out our relationship for the two years following Brexit Day, a transition period during which they negotiate the long-term future relationship. The withdrawal agreement contains a substantial section dedicated to citizen and other rights, specifically uh, specifying exactly those rights that will be available to EU citizens living in Britain after Brexit. According to the agreement, EU citizens living in Britain will be able to apply for something called settled status in order to retain their EU rights. Lo and behold, the latest position from the British government is that Irish citizens born in the North won't be entitled to apply for settled status under the withdrawal agreement. Why? Because according to the Home Office, Irish citizens born in the North are actually British citizens, so there is no need to apply for settled status, and by extension, this excludes them from retaining any EU rights available under the withdrawal agreement. This will make uh, them the only category of EU citizens not eligible for settled status, another denial of rights that brings us back to an earlier point about the British being derelict in their duty to uphold the Good Friday Agreement. I have a very short period of time, and while there is still a whole lot uh, more uh, to say, Tishak, the reason we face these problems, these anomalies, is because we aren't yet the republic envisaged by our forebears. We aren't yet the republic declared in 1916, endorsed in 1918, and asserted in 1919 an event we all gathered to commemorate and exult just a few months ago. The lifelong dream, as you put it in your address, is not yet realised. So now is the time to prepare, to plan, to engage, to use this challenge, this institution, uh, to plan for new constitutional horizons. Now is the time to realise a real republic, and now is the time for Irish unity.